You've seen how long this video is, but if you're at all into Second World War history, or commando warfare, or just really insane real life stories, then you might enjoy sticking through this one as I chat about Churchill's Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, subtitled The Mavericks Who Plotted Hitler's Defeat, a book by Giles Milton, apparently the author of Nathaniel's Nutmeg, whatever that means. This book begins with the Second World War in 1939 and is about some of the British pioneers of the use of commando tactics and weaponry in modern warfare. It talks about how a handful of brilliant and very hardworking people managed to create a form of warfare that did an immense amount of damage to first the German and then later the Japanese militaries. The author, Giles Milton, spent three years doing extremely in-depth research, even digging up a lot of previously unseen documents. And the book is written in a somewhat strange manner of one quote after another after another of the source material and while it can seem a little dry and fractured at times ultimately Giles was able to create an extremely compelling narrative. One thing he did really well was to give the reader a very detailed picture of the mad geniuses who created this top secret war department. And make no mistake while they were geniuses they were absolutely crazy. The couple of people who formed this division had a real knack for locating the crackpot inventors amongst the civilian population who could possibly invent the truly unique weapons that were required for commando warfare, both on land and at sea. Let's look at Cecil Clark, for instance. Cecil Clark was a civilian who designed and built caravans, or what we non-British would call RVs and camper trailers. But his inventive mechanical brilliance got him hired onto the fledgling military organization. He would quickly become one of its chief inventors of unconventional weapons and trainers of future saboteurs. But here's the type of guy Cecil was. No sooner had his first sabotage students arrived from London than they realized that theirs was to be a training unlike any other. One of them, Peter Kemp, couldn't work out if Cecil was mad or brilliant or both. Quote, he had a disquieting habit during lectures of exhibiting to us one of his pets, he means an explosive device, with a large charge attached, placing it on the desk in front of him, cocking it, and announcing, this will go off in five minutes. He would then proceed with his lecture, unconcerned by the ticking bomb while his students nervously counted the minutes. During the last half of the last minute, the sound of his voice was almost drowned by the shuffling and scraping of chairs, especially from the front rows. When only five seconds remained and every head in the class was down, he would suddenly remember, pick up the infernal machine, look at it for a moment thoughtfully, and toss it nonchalantly through the window to explode on the lawn with barely a second to spare. Another key figure was a military officer and absolute mathematical prodigy named Miles Jeffress. Here's a brief description of him and his work environment. These new recruits found that life at the Furs was never dull. Bombs exploded unexpectedly, sheds caught fire, and on one memorable occasion, an entire corner of the building containing some lethal liquid blew up in a spectacular explosion. It was hastily repaired before the owner of the property, Major Abrahams, got to hear about it. One of Good Eve's underlings noted that, quote, the least concerned observer present when things went wrong was the impresario of this unusual establishment, Jefferis. He impressed everyone with his habit of walking around with his pockets crammed full of detonators, small batteries, and pieces of wire. It was a miracle he never blew himself up. The other two guys who came aboard early on were Bill Sykes and William Fairbairn. Due to the rather sketchy nature of their pre-war work, they had a lot of personal experience with up-close killing, and their role in the organization throughout the duration of the war was to teach all the new recruits how to kill a human quickly and efficiently, either barehanded or with hand-to-hand -hand weapons such as knives. Here's an extended look at these two characters. The first of the men, Eric Sykes, was known to his friends as Bill. He was an expert in silent killing, chilling, ruthless, and clinical, and a man whose every sentence was said to end in the words, quote, and then kick him in the testicles, unquote. His previous employment had been in Shanghai, where he had worked as the representative of two American firearms companies, Colt and Remington. Sykes' comrade-in-arms was William 
Shanghai Buster Fairbairn. Kill or be killed was his catchphrase. His friends knew him as Delicate Dan, but he referred to himself as Mr. Murder Made Easy. He would smile benevolently as he taught his pupils how to break a man's neck or smash his spine across your knee. Fairbairn had been headhunted for employment by the Shanghai Municipal Police in 1907, a position he was to hold for the next 33 years. The city was infamous for its armed gangsters, drug runners, and violent criminals. Not for nothing was it known as the toughest city in the world. Fairbairn's job was to quell gang warfare, a task he set to with such relish that there were some who wondered if he wasn't a gangster himself. He rapidly established his riot squad, a team of 120 hand-picked men who were trained in what he called gutter fighting. All his men were crack shots, but Fairbairn himself favored close-range physical combat over the bullet. Fairbairn came to know Eric Sykes through his work with Colton Remington. By 1926, he had drafted him into his riot squad, where Sykes swiftly proved himself a valuable addition to the team. The two men shared a passion for dirty killing. That phrase, kill or be killed, wasn't their only catchphrase. A fellow who trained under them had this to say. We learned to use pistols, knives, and poison, said Newt Hukulid, together with all the weapons nature had given us, our fists and feet. There was one constant refrain, never give a man a chance, were words we were always hearing. If you've got him down, kick him to death. One of the guys at the head of this whole shady crew was an officer from the Scottish Highlands named Colin Gubbins, a veteran of the First World War. He was quite an outgoing fellow who ended up being pretty popular with the staff who worked under him. Yet Gubbins had an additional quality that captivated those close to him, one they found impossible to pin down. There was something about him that made him somehow different, said his friend, Peter Coley. That something was almost certainly the fact that he was an outsider. The names of his acolytes spoke volumes. Alfgar Hesketh Pritchard, Edward Beddington Behrens, Douglas Dodds Parker, and Bickham Sweet Escott. All had been educated at the same universities, and all had known each other since prep school. Now they found themselves working for a boss who came from a world at a far remove from the silver-spooned squirearchies of the home counties. Gubbins had left school at 16. He had not gone to university and had none of the old boy connections of those who now served under him. Gubbins, who the book describes as having been raised by a veritable clan of terrifying Scottish ants, was also way ahead of his time when it came to hiring women for important roles. Based on how he's described in this book, I'm not sure if his primary motivation was a respect for the capabilities of women or an interest in having a whole lot of young women working under him. But here's a fairly examination of this interesting topic. The second major decision made by Gubbins was to employ women, lots of them, and not just as secretaries. They were to be given key positions of responsibility. Margaret had been the first to note that Gubbins didn't have any discrimination against women, yet even she was only dimly aware of the growing number of young ladies working in Baker Street until one day she looked up from her desk and realized that she was surrounded by dozens of female faces. The most important of the administrative jobs was that of country registrar. The registrars controlled all the secret files, including what Margaret called the nerve center of the country sections. This center contained highly sensitive information about all the saboteurs, along with plans of factories and installations targeted for destruction. As such, it contained many of the secrets of Baker Street. Gubbins insisted that the registrars were women, for he found them more trustworthy than men. Gubbins also hired the services of the all-female first aid nursing yeomanry, employing its members as drivers, telegraph operators, and signal experts. One of those who worked for him, Sue Ryder, got to know Gubbins well. She said his conviction that women were better at doing this work than men won him few friends in the Whitehall establishment. He was highly disliked by people in the war cabinet and foreign office. They couldn't stick his guts. He was an exception, said Joan, adding that in staff relations, as in much else, he was ahead of his time. In addition to employing women and civilians, they also scraped together experienced staff from wherever they could, with wounded soldiers providing a pool of expertise. This passage talks about that and also emphasizes the extreme stress that these folks were under as they literally worked 16 hours per day, six days per week, for three years straight through the duration of the war. Gubbins and Dodds Parker were assisted in their work by serving pilots who were brought in to give advice on airstrips, landing grounds, and potential dropping 
camping sites. Daphne was appalled to see the terrible battle scars on these men. One of them, Bill Simpson, had no hands and no eyelids. She didn't dare to ask what had happened, but it brought home to her the dangers of guerrilla warfare. A second pilot, also working in the operations room, was more forthcoming about the occupational hazards of his work. He told her an extraordinary tale of how his parachute had failed to open as he bailed out of his stricken plane. Quote, he heard this noise and realized that it was himself screaming. And then he had a feeling of euphoria, laughing and throwing things out of his pockets. He had a miraculous escape from death, landing in a tree with no injuries. He had been posted to the operations room while he got his nerve back. It was not the best place to unwind, for this was the most stressful place in Baker Street. The pressures of work got to everyone, even Gubbins. On one occasion, he emerged from his office and noticed that a member of the staff had left a bicycle in the atrium outside his door. He took one look at this bicycle, jumped on it, and went off at high speed round the fountain about six times. He then replaced the bike against the wall and calmly returned to his desk, his stress levels marginally reduced. In addition to all these British folks, they also had to work with a wide variety of people from all over the world in the various missions that they were undertaking. So in the process, we get a couple of somewhat humorous snapshots of national cultural differences. Chris Monty Woodhouse and his group had jumped from the second Liberator aircraft and had fared rather better. Woodhouse himself had landed with scarcely a bump, not harder than stepping off a table, while the others had also dropped without mishap. There was a moment of panic when they were surrounded by Greek soldiers who suspected them of being Germans, but Woodhouse was quick to put them right. He called out, I am a British officer! To which one of the Greeks replied, I am a Greek officer! He then rushed towards Woodhouse and kissed him on both cheeks. Greeks. <laughs> am I right? As for these military old boys who so despised Gubbins and his staff, given that this sort of commando warfare was so new and so unconventional, and given the sorts of everyday folk like Cecil Clark who were running the show, the British aristocracy who headed every branch of the military not only resisted everything they were doing for almost the entire duration of the war, but they openly despised them and turned up their very noble noses at them. For example, the commandos relied very heavily on the Royal Air Force for transportation to countries all over Europe to be parachuted behind enemy lines. But the RAF invariably fought against providing the necessary resources and insisted that dropping tons and tons of bombs on the targets was a better use of the might of the British Empire. Here's what the book says. Gubbins had been working as hard as his agents, planning his first sabotage mission within weeks of joining Baker Street. Intelligence had revealed that German pilots of Kampfgeschwader 100, a bomber squadron in France, were driven to Vaughn's aerodrome each evening in two coaches. Gubbins' idea was to parachute a small team of guerrillas into Brittany, ambush the coaches, and shoot all the pilots inside. The planned operation soon hit a snag. Charles Portal, chief of the air staff, was vehemently opposed to such ungentlemanly conduct and refused the use of RAF planes. I think that the dropping of men dressed in civilian clothes for the purpose of attempting to kill members of the opposing forces is not an operation with which the Royal Air Force should be associated. He said that there was a big ethical difference between smuggling a spy into a country and this entirely new scheme for dropping what one can only call assassins. He wasn't the only one in the RAF who outright refused to support them. Here's what happened when they were trying to plan an operation to sabotage the Peugeot factory in Sochaux, France. The most sensible course would have been to place the entire operation in Gubbins hands. Instead, the Sochaux brief was given to the chief of the air staff, Charles Portal, and the head of bomber command, Arthur Harris. Portal had already clashed with Gubbins on several occasions and was his antithesis in every respect. A sharp-nosed warmonger with an unswerving belief that might is right. The principal advocate of the indiscriminate aerial bombardment of Germany, his specific recommendation was to carpet bomb every German city with a population of more than 100,000. Irritated by Gubbins' constant demands for more planes, he added, I cannot divert aircraft from a certainty to a gamble which may be a gold mine or may be completely worthless. 
On 15th of July, Lord Portal and Bomber Harris decided to put their gilt-edged investment to good use. Their intention was to drop so much high explosive on the Sochaux factory that it would cease to function for the rest of the war. No fewer than 165 Halifax bombers set off from their base that evening, preceded by pathfinders whose task it was to drop incendiary flares around the factory's perimeter as a marker for the bombers. As the aerial armada thundered over Sochaux, it dumped vast quantities of explosives onto the industrial complex below. That night, Bomber Harris went to bed a contented man. He awoke to news that was rather less edifying. The Pathfinder flares had landed short of the factory in the residential area of Sochaux, with devastating consequences for the local population. The pilots had dropped no fewer than 700 high explosive shells on the villages of Sochaux, Vieux Charmont, Alenjois, and Nami. 125 civilians were killed instantly, and a further 250 gravely injured. The destruction on the ground was catastrophic. More than 100 houses were pulverized and a further 400 seriously damaged. The town hall was flattened along with the local school, post office, and police headquarters. A mere 30 bombs, strays, hit the factory, causing negligible damage. The report handed to Bomber Harris made for unpalpable reading. Production at the factory was normal immediately after the raid. The Air Force weren't the only branch of the military who outright refused to acknowledge this unconventional unit. Milas Jeffress and Cecil Clark had together come up with an amazing anti-submarine weapon to replace depth charges that they called the Hedgehog. And here's how the Royal Navy responded to this new weapon. Many Royal Navy captains were used to weapons which fired with a resounding bang, as one put it, and were not readily impressed with the performance of a contact bomb which exploded only on striking an unseen target. They preferred to stick with the tried and tested depth charge when attacking U-boats, even though it had a hit rate of less than 1 in 10. Jeffress's technology was too smart to be believed. The Americans proved quicker in embracing the Hedgehog, equipping large numbers of their ships in the final months of 1943. It's interesting that the Americans didn't have the same hang-ups as the British hierarchy did towards accepting what was coming out of this office. All in all, the leadership situation in the British military was best summed up by the description of the head of the Ministry of Supply. Leslie Bergen, the recently appointed head of the Ministry of Supply, was a gaunt-faced bureaucrat and liberal MP whose final common speech as a backbencher concerned mind-numbing details about the Selby Bypass and Toll Bridge. His appointment as head of one of the key government ministries was memorably described as, quote, another horse from Caligula's well-stocked stable. So with all this outright hostility being faced by this unit from all branches of the military, how did they even become a thing? Well, there's a reason this book is called Churchill's Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. The only reason that any of this happened was because Churchill directly supported them every step of the way. The book seems to suggest that the reasons Churchill was able to so enthusiastically get behind these unorthodox ways of killing people were because he was both a visionary and a horrible alcohol-fueled monster. Here are some snippets from the book. Churchill had known nothing of the work being undertaken by Milas Jeffress and his team, nor even of Colin Gubbins, but he was no stranger to dirty warfare. Two decades earlier, when serving as Minister for Munitions, he had taken the unprecedented decision to use chemical weapons against Bolshevik forces in northern Russia. He had also argued in favor of using chemical gas against the truculent tribes of the northwest frontier. When his colleagues demurred, he told them he was, quote, strongly in favor of using poisoned gas against uncivilized tribes, and proceeded to lambaste them for their squeamishness. And in this final passage, Churchill defends Sykes's murder classes. Such training was vitally important for the missions that lay ahead. Gubbin's goal was to produce the most elite guerrillas in the world. In Sykes and Fairbairn, he had the best tutors in the world. The two men faced constant criticism from the war office, but Gubbins always championed their cause. This became more difficult when the criticism came from senior generals, as it often did. On one occasion, Fairbairn had taken his best pupil, William Pilkington, to a home guard training session in Glasgow. They had just been teaching their audience how to sever someone's carotid artery with a sharpened trowel when there was a furious cry from the back of the room. Stop this at once! 
unbeknown to anyone, the training session had been brought to the attention of Major General Sir Edward Spears, a senior army officer of the old school. He was appalled by what he had just heard. This is monstrous, he bawled. Don't pay attention to this dreadful teaching. Remember, we are British. We do not stoop to thug element tactics. We do not stab in the back. We fight as men. We do not slash. Now, this must cease. Fairbairn was furious. He had never respected authority and was so angered by Major General Spears' outburst that he answered back in the most colorful terms, hurling abuse at the general and telling him he was an idiot. He might have been court-martialed on this spot had it not been for the arrival of someone of even greater stature. Unseen by anyone, Winston Churchill had slipped into the room just after Major General Spears. The two men had been visiting Glasgow together. Churchill was grinning widely, very much the worse for wear, with saliva dripping from his cigar. Steadying himself with a walking cane, he called out, Come, Teddy, for Christ's sake, you've said enough. Come and have a drink. He then grabbed Spears and pulled him outside. Good work, he shouted to the room at large. Keep it up. I'm going to leave behind these specific people for now and take a very brief glimpse at the equipment and techniques before finishing up with the results of all this work. You'll notice that I spent a huge amount of time on the people and almost no time on the amazing missions that they were undertaking. And that's because I think the real interest of the book is the examination of the individuals. Whereas you can go on Wikipedia and read about all these interesting missions and the facts behind what was going on, you don't get that same really personal personalized look at the individuals who were involved and who were responsible for them. Plus, I don't want to spoil all the super exciting details for when you read the book. So anyhow, early in the war they were trying to create an underwater mine and were struggling to come up with a way to keep the fuses waterproof. Here is the solution that they ultimately found. Their solution was once again homespun but inventive. They pulled a condom over the striking mechanism and found that it formed a perfect damp proof sleeve, expanding neatly over the various bumps and creases. Thus it was that two middle-aged gentlemen found themselves walking around Bedford, going from chemist to chemist, buying up their entire stocks of condoms, and earning ourselves an undeserved reputation for being sexual athletes. McRae neglected to record whether nine months later Bedford experienced any short-term spike in his birth rate. So sticking with the theme of male genitalia but moving to the complete opposite end of the humor spectrum, while countless lives could be saved by utilizing precision strikes by commando units to eliminate targets as opposed to carpet bombing and conventional warfare, this here is a reminder that it was still war with all the inhuman horror that that entails. This brief quote is in reference to the German invasion of England that everyone was expecting. Castration was to be an important element in Gubbin's game of psychological warfare against captured Nazis. His men were to, quote, cut off their knackers to demoralize the rest. If all went to plan, the trees of Kent were to be festooned with German testicles. So leaving that behind and moving on now to the results of this new form of warfare, I previously talked about the RAF bombing of the Peugeot factory and what a disaster that was. Reading further, we discovered that they did eventually send in a saboteur team who very successfully blew up the factory and took it out of commission for quite a long time. As a result, it ended up being a striking example of the effectiveness of commando warfare in comparison to conventional bombing. A similar thing was observed with the Allies' war in Europe. One thing that is lost in all the talk of the incredible invasion fleet and beach landings at D-Day is the fact that at the same time, this group of people arranged to parachute 300 saboteurs in teams of three and more than 4,000 tons of sabotage equipment and explosives into France in order to disrupt all the German infrastructure at the same time as D-Day was occurring. Here are some of the unsung accomplishments of that vast and hidden army. Under the cover of darkness, teams crept out into the blustery night, their knapsacks filled with explosives. Bridges were blown, vital junctions destroyed, and all the roads leading to Normandy scattered with tire busters. The railways were hit particularly hard, with the system cut in almost 1,000 places. Gubbins would later learn that this was more than the British and American air forces had achieved over the previous two months. 
In the immediate aftermath of the Allies' establishment of a foothold in Normandy on D-Day, one of their greatest fears was a very large German tank division that was just three days away. This was Hitler's elite 2nd SS Panzer Division, known as Das Reich, and there was a very realistic possibility that they could rush in and push the Allies back into the sea before they had a chance to build a strong presence in France. However, thanks to teams of saboteurs who hindered the progress of this tank division every step of the way, Instead of taking them three days to reach the Allies, it took them 17 days. The Allies saved countless civilian and military lives every time they chose a commando strike over carpet bombing. For instance, one of the most incredible stories told in the book is the destruction of the Norsk Hydro Heavy Water Plant. When the Germans conquered Norway, they got access to a plant that made heavy water, which was vital to their nuclear program. This seemingly impregnable structure was built on the side of a remote Norwegian mountain. Yet, a very small team of commandos was somehow able to pull off some real Mission Impossible stuff by infiltrating the facility, blowing up the vital equipment while still on site, and then exfiltrate again all without a single person on either side being injured. However, this lack of death is simply unacceptable to those who make war. So the thing that's really hard to swallow is that the Germans had a habit of ruthlessly murdering hundreds of local civilians in retaliation for major acts of sabotage. The leaders of this unit were well aware of this and they had to bear the burden of these deaths every time they planned a mission. In one example, a heavy price was paid for the interference with the 2nd SS Panzer Division. Das Reich had a reputation for ruthlessness, and it now revealed this as it passed through the village of Oradour. In retaliation for the capture of Major Kampf and a blaze of partisan activity around the town of Toul, 624 inhabitants of Oradour were slaughtered in cold blood. As another example, a couple of very daring men successfully assassinated the monstrous German General Reinhard Heydrich, who is known as Hitler's Butcher of Prague. This was the result of that assassination. Colonel Morovetch and Colin Gubbins always knew that Czech civilians would pay a high price for the assassination. Several thousand were killed in the aftermath of Heydrich's death, and there was a renewed reign of terror throughout the country. But Moravec remained convinced that the assassination was justified, arguing that the Nazi killings would have happened even if Heydrich had not been assassinated. The eradication of the Czech nation and its amalgamation into the Reich, including the systematic murder of its leaders, was the assignment with which he came to Prague. He wrote a personal letter to Gubbins expressing his congratulations and admiration for a job well done. Winston Churchill expressed his full approval when he learned news of the attack. He was untroubled by political assassinations. Mind you, on the flip side, some Germans openly admired the astonishing bravery and skill of the commandos. Here's the German response to the aftermath of the destruction of the Norsk Hydro plant. On 10th of March, 10 days after the attack, Gubbins received the sweetest news of all. He received a message from another agent at the plant describing the visit to Norsk Hydro of General von Falkenhorst, the commander of the occupying German forces in Norway. At the sight of the ruined plant, he smiled and said, This is the most splendid coup I have seen in this war. A consummate professional, he admired the saboteur's work and conceded that they had pulled off a dazzling act of destruction. Once he had inspected the damage, he ordered the release of all the Norwegian civilians who had been rounded up. He then issued a second order that all the German sentries on duty that night were to be arrested. Their eventual fate remains unknown, although the senior guard was later said to have been sent to the Eastern Front as punishment. And that was quite a punishment indeed. Ooh. I should note, though, that not all the missions were so subtle. In 1942, the team was tasked with destroying an important dock in France, the saint Nazaire dock. And their solution was to take a ship that was a relic of the First World War, load a four and a half ton bomb into its hold, put a time delay fuse of a few hours onto the bomb, then ram the ship straight into the dock and try to get away before the enormous explosion occurred. Unfortunately for them, in the fight to get away, 169 commandos were killed and 215 captured. But when the bomb went off, literally hundreds of German soldiers were killed and the dock was knocked out of commission for a full decade. And then fast forwarding to the end of the war, by the time Japan surrendered in the summer of 1945, Gubbins was in command of a slick, well-oiled machine. Baker Street's success was no longer in question. 
One expert contended that it had proved a great deal more efficacious than Bomber Command, especially in France. For four years, Arthur Harris and Charles Portal had sent wave after wave of bombers across the English Channel and had made much larger holes in the ground than Baker Street and damaged a great deal more inessential property. Gubbin saboteurs, by contrast, had crippled 90 Nazi-run factories, factories essential to Hitler's war machine, and put them completely out of action, with a total load of explosives that was less than that carried by one light bomber. And that, of course, had been just one small part of their work. So at the end of it all, where were the accolades for these incredibly inventive and brave people who sacrificed so much to help win the war? Well. Unfortunately for them, their work was highly classified and remained so after the war. When the fighting was finished, the regular military was only too happy to send this unit packing, while they received all the glory and the attention of the historians for the great set-piece battles and troop movements that so readily grabbed the public's and the professional's attention. After years of non-stop work in training commandos how to kill people, Eric Sykes dropped dead from a heart attack a mere four days after the armistice with Germany was signed. As for Colin Gubbins, with his wartime spent working 16-hour days to provide tireless leadership to the unit and employment to many young women and men, he was unceremoniously discarded by the military and left to find work with a rubber company and then with a textile firm. Cecil Clark, who had used his incredible engineering intelligence to invent many new and unusual ways of killing people, was so appalled by the destruction wrought by the nuclear bombs in Japan that he became an enthusiastic member of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament and continued to lobby against nuclear weapons for the rest of his life. And he went back to building his RVs. So. I'm glad that Giles Milton devoted so much time to making sure that their stories were told. As the history guy here on YouTube says, it's history worth remembering. And all this has inspired me to break out my cooperative game V Commandos and to do some of my own sabotage missions against German installations. Holy cow, you made it to the end of this video. That really does mean a lot to me. The other thing that means a lot to me is if you would give it a thumb up or subscribe to my channel, or maybe share this video with one person that you think would enjoy it. Cheers. Or if you're just into really crazy real life stories, then hey, ha, huh, hey, her. Uh, this lamp. Eric Sykes and William Fairburn had somebody who trained under the... As for these military... Mm -hmm. The Air Force... Air Force... The Air Force... Um, that's not a correct passage. What the f Fairbairn had taken his best pupil, William... Pil Fairbairn had taken his best pupil, William Pink... Oh my gosh. Fairbairn had taken his best pupil, William Pilling. <laughs> Will William Pilk William Pilkington. William Pilkington. William Pilkington. William Pilkington. And then in um, and then in contrast to this lack of excitement is this. And then in contrast to the lack of excitement. And then in contrast to the lack of. <laughs> as opposed to the more popular form. Did I read the correct? One, two, three. We would read that the saboteur team that went into the factory after that, they were Castration was to be an important element. <laughs> That's so funny that I went from condoms to castration and I never even realized that. Oh my god, that's horrible.